Hello there, everyone, and thank you for rejoining me here in, you know, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Philip Hardlover, but we gotta talk about disassociating from Wallace as well as Bleeding Hearts Club, but this one first. America's liberals and progressives are prone to boasting that they alone have brought about Wallace's disastrous fall from grace with the protests and riots. That cannot be any further from the, from the truth. Sure, picket signs of police brutality catch the press's cameras like nothing else, but what many ignore is the plot of the innocent conservative, who either did not ask for or have been duped by the duplicity of Alabama's erstwhile favorite son. Decades from now, the next generation will look back at this decade to look for lessons they can apply up to the present. America's conservatives will not be found wanting in this regard and sign the Civil Rights Act. It had taken no small amount of goodwill and political capital, but pr the president has gathered enough support in Congress to finally push the Civil Rights Act through the Senate and the House of Representatives. Now, this piece of tumultuous legis legis legislation allows it to tap the resolute desk, smaller than its many drafts have ever been, and accompanied by somewhat muted jubilation from within the Oval Office. All that awaits is a, hand, a handful of strokes etched in black fountain ink by the highest office in the land to become ironclad law and club now. By nearly all measures, Henry Kissinger was a conservative. He preferred balanced budgets and believed autocracies were in the best position to conduct foreign policy. He idolized the 19th century Austrian foreign minister Clemens von Metternich, who served as a statesman for over 37 years and managed to the defense of European ancient regimes from the Napoleonic Revolutionary time. However, Metternich likely would not have approved of the company Kissinger kept during his leisure time as a national security advisor populated his staff with liberals and academic radicals in striking contrast to his own beliefs. This was his Bleeding Hearts Club, a focus group for Kissinger's national security policy among the, his staff that met unofficially at their executive office space. They disagreed with their boss on nearly everything, but the open-air debate structure kept all arguments professional and enjoyable. What do we do to do about Japan, Pose Kissinger, who nibbled at the sandwich as a small crowd of postgraduate staffers crowded his desk? Indeed, making detente with Japan was an excellent idea when presented to the president, but the specifics of maneuvering this monumental task was beyond Kissinger. Suggestions ranged from letters to the, uh, to the emperor to the false flag defection with reasonable he heads, uh, landing on the consensus pick that Kissinger approaches the Japanese ambassador directly. But where? My father works for the Iberian Embassy offered to meet Staffer. Her voice uncertain of its place in the conversation. He says it'll be a banquet this Friday. Could you meet the ambassador there? Murmurs followed as Kissinger considered the suggestion, and the doctor stamped his fingers. An excellent suggestion, Alice. Very well. My name is Alice, but thank you, sir. And then they get a discreet note. So, what's on the Swords Act? We've got some comments to go through as well, such as, will you do uh, Heart Focus Street tomorrow? Or at least in this episode. And basically, yeah. Uh, we shall overcome you during that, please. Go ahead. So, another comment was, Rip John Glenn. God, rest in peace. I love... John Glenn. I wish they didn't remove him, but, you know, it is what it is. Also, this is all part of the uh, uh, Smoke and Mirrors. I was looking at this. Their faction of the strong. Coalition sports lacking. These guys are durable and waning. The Democratic Party is durable, terrific, poor, and waning. So, Coalition is durable support with a waning 68% approval. So, we want to keep it higher. So, I don't want to spend too much political power, though, but we'll see. 65. That's one we'll last. That's the last one we'll do for now. It's poor, terrific. 70% we just increased it sell. And well, the support is lofty. Not bad. So we still got to go through all this stuff. I'll be honest, I don't understand this completely yet, but we're not even focusing on this part, so I'm not super worried about it for now. Um, let's open up the CIA tab once more, because I actually, I spent the last like four hours trying to get to this point again, because we had to, I basically had to replay this, which, which sucks. Like, I don't want to re want to replay, but there was a hot fix between this episode and the last, which is fine, you know, I get it. Um, but at the same time, like, it's so much. But, but because I had to replay this, also here's where we're at. Wow, there's a lot of MPP support. Also, I have not used Consequence uh, for this campaign so far. Philip Arts, 33%. That's even more. Jackson, Communism, a little bit of National Daddyism. But here is the electoral, or the Senate at least for now. 37 Republicans, 14 Democrats, 19 Progressives, and 28 Nationalists. So, also, I do want to show you, um, I guess this is everything we had. 64 when we first started. 66 when I first started, really. In the 68, which was about the most recent one, presidential election. Um, Nixon, Jackson, 64, it was Bennett versus Wallace. Wallace won pretty handily, as you see. In 1968, though, he lost pretty handily to Philip Hart with about 6 million more votes. So, solid south in Indiana and part of the North New England area and the Rockies, but other than that, that's how we ended up. So, that's actually really cool. But out of the Civil Rights Act, we can finally start doing other stuff here, too. So, old friends, new dynamic. America's highest legislature knew hard for his unwavering, almost headstrong commitment to civil rights and the little man. No plea for moderation to turn him from becoming one of Kennedy's most loyal bannermen during the Birmingham campaign. No plea for you need to keep him from voicing his dissent at every attempt to wring money out of the welfare when the people need them most. The lengths to which Hart defended his principles earned not just the admiration of his like-minded peers, but also the begrudging respect of his opponents. States may flip and parties may switch, but the saying went, but you can always rely on Hart to do the right thing. The campaign, assuming such a reputation, will translate to multi-partisan support for his presidential agenda. That has not necessarily come to pass, though. <clears throat> 
His first while peers seemed expected differently of a president than a, of a senator. As Republican acquaintances kept the congratulations courteous but coldly brief. The progressives that once joined him for lunch had scheduled no visit since his November victory. The less said of the Nationals, the better. Even his own party, once in lockstep behind his plans, now cautioned restraint over his reckless initiatives. The whiplash surprised Hart in his several days of his quiet reflection. I'll take the new president some time to plan around his tired of his obsolescence, but he's com confident that he will soon adjust. He can't despair now when he has so much change in the balance. New, new reality of the relationship with the fellow senators, reality check, and civil rights acts passes. Oh, today's a victory. Let's remember that, brothers and sisters, because it's a victory for every one of you. And it's a victory that is only due to, to every one of you. Ralph Abernathy is a platonic ideal of a black minister, offering inspir inspiring homilies with confidence, charisma, and just a bit of pun -ish. Standing before a cheering crowd of hundreds on the steps of the Capitol, is the Moses made flesh, delivering the news of the bill that just minutes ago became law. The whips more than one SLC, SCLC. Activists chuckled ruefully at the irony had promised an easy passage to the Senate, and they had kept their word. Martin is still in Atlanta, but it will be in Washington soon enough, and for now, Abernathy will certainly do. For so many years longer than any of our lives or alive of our mothers and fathers, America has been a nightmare for black men and women. Wallace, he certainly tried to keep it that way, but Wallace is gone, and now with our efforts and blood, sweat, and tears, there's just yet hope that we will wake up. Can we truly make America as good as we promised? Nice. Cuff to the chair. The dilemma on whether or not to excerpt executive authority at this early in the presidency gives heart a tough choice. Mark Twain may have said that the man who wants to be president the most is also the last man who deserves it. Therefore, the last man who wanted to be president is the man America needs. So, must be dragging, kicking, must be dragged kicking and screaming all the way to the 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue so he can save the country from itself. Although Hart sees a man, not a cure all in the mirror, kicking and screaming aptly describes his experience in the campaign trail. Part, party insiders had egged him on for years to toss his hat, and eventually did so only because he had cho no choice. Alternative to running was standing beside, well, conniving men dismantled the causes he championed piecemeal. All he did was say his piece as his allies dragged him from the soapbox to soapbox and found the resolute desk. Dreams took him here, but what comes after that? The sheer breadth of answers can even paralyze even the most Star Wars idealist. Ender de, Lap de Lesops Morrison. The man who brought New Orleans to the modern age spent a decade making big plans out of big dreams, and in his Creole wisdom, the vice president suggests hearkening to FDR's first hundred days. For now, EOs or executive orders are on the way to go, mainly to establish agencies that are, uh, the administration will rely on down the line, and reality check. Also, uh, I'm still doing like this as well, which doesn't really do very much, but it just gives more stuff here, more surplus. Even though I have hurt the growth overall over the entire campaign, but the debt is not bad. So, um, reality check. Later, see it in Philip Hart's offensive charm or charm offensive. Was on board the presidential yacht Sequoia, where a night of scenic liquor lubricated sailing along the Potomac was poisoned with the hearts of the congressional Republican liberals. Hart knew from his Senate days that liberal Rockefeller Republicans were the backbone of successful progressive progressive legislation and figured that his amicable, even friendly relationship with the likes of Hugh Scott and Jacob Javits would earn the new administration some favor. As the president introduced himself to the Georgetown socialites and upstate congressional types. President Hart introduced himself to the unspoken guest of honor, tapping the governor of New York to join him privately in the ship's foremost lounge. There, seated below the presidential seal on both sides, the vibrant image of Washington at night, Philip Hart and Nelson Rockefeller got to talking. You give me hope about honesty and government, Mr. President, mused Rockefeller, nursing a drink, but I wouldn't count on the coalition for votes. The teetotal president, enjoying a cream soda return? If I can't count on my party for support, then it feels like we have bigger trouble. Rockefeller smirked, if slightly before resting a placid grin. The hard part, I represent several Republicans who say we do not entirely support your policy agenda. To be frank, Mr. President, if you want votes, you're not just a Democratic president. You're a Republican, too, and we've hedged our bets on your success until we know you've committed. you're committed to that. I don't believe you will see much Republican support in the administration's policies. As he passed the exhortation, a nervous felt heart smiled, emerged on the president's face, finally spoke up. Uh, you're absolutely correct about the coalition. I won't let any of you down. Stunned by this rabbit episode of political theater, Hart stood up and shook the governor's hand before returning to the party. So much for goodwill. Silently mutes Hart, for who, for the first time, felt aware of the isolation that plagues the president. So much for friendship, nothing is for granted. Oh boy. While well, support among the Labour Democrats is all but assured, Philip Hart will have to maintain a positive relationship to the wider Congress. If he wishes to effectively legislate. Crap. Um. So, seeing in the Senate, peers, into our peers in the coalition are more than able to track a smooth path with President Hart's agenda. Increase, 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 increase. The relationship with the Senate will improve, or some lip service. The uh, NPP not going out was a force that cannot be ignored. Create some deals to create a patchy coalition that delivers his agenda to his desk. Um, do this one, owing to Coronation Week, all the parties in the Senate's opinion in the President Hart's will be reset. Increase likelihood of the Republicans to vote in favor. A little miracle gain trust obtained for weeks in the President. Heart. Uh, never any campaign. Likely have Democrats will vote in favor of our agenda. Democrats will like that. Urban voters will with an immediate change in partisanship. Some pixie dust. Well, oh, machine. Well, if we come back over here. And also, like, this one is for Republicans? Well, coronation week. Republicans vote in favor. So, really, 37 is the most. We want, really, Republicans, Democrats, and even progressives. 
without even just Democrats and Republicans, if they all vote the same, we'll be okay. I'm sure we'll pull some from the center as well for whatever we choose. Um, some lip service. That wouldn't be bad, but I want more Republicans in all honesty. Increase the likelihood of Democrats voting would be nice as well. And we could really get some Dixiecrats on our side too. I'm no miracle worker. Well, I'm not sure which way we want to go. Especially with the Senate improvement. I'm not sure how important that is. Um, you know, let's let's go this way. Senate of the Senate. The president reserved his election night campaign for when he was absolutely certain that he had a lot, shot at fulfilling the, his ideas wholesale. Then Walter Cronkite announced a Republican Democrat trifecta at 7.48 p.m. And in the hours after that, his campaign staff saw a logical sort of substituting every gallon of Phil Parts blow with 24 proof alcohol. After spending days making allies out of friends of the coalition, within the coalition, President Hart now sits in the Oval Office knowing that both the people and the powers that stand, or that be, stand behind his back, there's no better feeling. For a mandate this strong, that Hart's Let's Hart begin his term with the transformative reforms he promised to the voters and to himself. No need to turn him with compromise where he can go far just by doubling down. No need to hold back when pushing forward without abandoning is both a necessary and a politically expedient choice. Now, he has set his eyes on the nation's homeless. With the Democrats to his left and the Republicans to his right, President Hart will give these list of souls the help they deserve but cannot grasp alone. Executive action. Well, I hadn't considered that, Joe. <coughs> J Jane, Jane, yeah, Jane. But uh, I see it mentioned in this brief that you sent me in a uh, prison fill apart thumb through the paper stack briefing, mindful of the single paper clip keeping the immense document together. The Vice President, Washington, from across the resolute desk as the President struggles against a file, painfully aware that the Secretary Jacobs' phone call was cutting into his allotted meeting time. Hart continued, yes, yeah, so I'll give some thought to this wealth question and get back to you. Or you can stop by the White House, fine, okay. Well, with that, the President finally placed down his phone, turned towards his guest with a smile. Hello, chap. Hello, Mr. President, returned the Vice President, who offered a meek smile of his own. I see the Secretary that's gotten her materials to you first. He gestured towards the thick document bearing health, education, and welfare letterhead on his title page, which the President readily handed over. Then, as Morrison skimmed the printed pages, Hart continued, saying, Yes, I'm equally interested in hearing your perspective, partially because I expect less reading. The two chuckled, and the Vice President pushed the packet aside. My first reaction is how dire these statistics are, and how conveniently effective these, frankly expensive, improvements will be. Of the to, to stop the problem of urban capital flight. If he had learned anything as mayor of New, York, New Orleans, the vice president stated it was that there was power in a well-funded feasibility study. Conservatives will eat us alive with this idea. Trust me on this one, Mr. President. Good numbers do get good results. That's a promise. Thus, a dilemma was presented to President Hart. Paul the advised the Secretary Jacobs and proceeded with a hue proposal, or he the uh, warning of vice president and settled any disputes with a study. Both options held merit. Proceeding as planned would result in a trim spending package, but the quick offensive could yield better policy. Following Morrison's advice would guarantee more broad support for the legislation and increase goodwill among Senate's holdouts at the cost of less effective legislation. It seems no matter what action President Hart takes, there will always be some kind of nefarious group that will be sharpening their knives. A bunch of hawks will increase their disdain for President by 10%. percent get more Republicans. Jacob's plan. Um, urban wealth will increase their disdain, which I don't like. Dixiecrats support goes up. Um, where are we at? Because this is stuff I, I'm not used to yet, so with this campaign, this is obviously not going to be... Um, optimal for how I do this. Also, uh, we, there's also a bug. The entire time I was doing this, and even when I reloaded my save, like, this still happened. We're still in the war with the South African War. When I were back, and as you can see, South Africa is, well, they're doing alright. You know, they're doing okay. Um, so, but, they didn't want to have OFN mandates. They wanted all of Central South Africa for themselves. So, yeah. It is what it is, you know. I'm not going to complain about it, but smoke and mirrors. So, with the Hardline Republicans, uh, we, already get, we already got their support too earlier. Harlan's Republican support will increase by 5%. Coalition will increase by 5 which is good. Which is good. We can use that. Or if all Jacob's plan, uh, increase the same by 10% urban wealth, which is not good. Harlan's support goes up by 5 But Dixiecrat's support also goes up by 5 as well. Dixiecrat uh, is actually terrific. Coalition support is actually very good. Spending power systems in average states will increase tremendously, though. More broad support for the legislation. Increased goodwill among senators. As less, less effective at legislation. Morrison's plan. Um, someone's not gonna like us. Uh, let's take a look. See, so again, budget budget hawks benefit of the doubt. Calm, supportive. We're failing to support civil rights advocates. What? What are you talking about? We literally just signed the Civil Rights Act. Are you freaking kidding me, bro? <sighs> They're so supportive of us, which is nice. I'm not sure. How, what does this percentage mean? Like, 2.5 is radically different from, from 81 percent. Like, out of out of what? Like, I'd like to know, like, out of what in total. Um, urban wealth. It's the calm, or budget hawks. Well, let's piss off the urban wealth. They're still calm, which is good, I guess. You know, whatever. Coordination week. 
the role of the inauguration may be behind the newfound Hart administration, uh, but that doesn't mean that the people of the nation are behind him too, after all. Hart is one of the most obscure figures to win the presidency in the last century, and while the voters may have learned who he is as a politician, they certainly haven't seen much of him as a person yet. Only with the United Nation behind him will Phil Hart be able to muster the kind of force needed for his agenda to pass smoothly, and the can keep the honeymoon with the American people going the better. A nation-spanning speaking tour may be just what the train needs to really get going out of the station. Similarly important, however, will be the one-on-one -on -one meetings with the influential RDC politicians who states who states the tour will happen to pass through. Philip Hart is no bull, and he's no pushover either, and his hope is that quiet persuasion will pay dividends and will certainly be put to the test as he meets with those who can make or break his agenda. The president may not have friends on Capitol Hill anymore, but certainly they don't have to be his enemies. So we gave him more Republicans, too. Cool. From the beginning. Since the formation of the Iberian Union, the Madrid government has maintained a custodianship of the former Portuguese and Spanish embassies as a mixed-use property. Um... The Spanish embassy was home to all consular services of the Union, and renters' fees from the former Portuguese complex covered most of the diplomatic mission's operating costs. As a result, Iberian ambassadors gained a reputation for using budget surpluses to hold prolific dinner parties for the Washington's elite. Uh, Henry Truman attended five such embassy di di parties during his career and had no difficulty fulfilling Dr. Henry Kissinger's unusual request for an invitation. When asked why he needed access, the National Security Advisor immediately asked, Networking. That wasn't far from the truth, as Kissinger quickly realized that many unfamiliar faces of the party were familiar with his writings on diplomacy. Discussing diplomacy with the Mexican ambassador yielded Kissinger access to a circle of notables which included the Japanese ambassador to the U.S., Ryuji Ryuji Take, uh, Takeuchi, whom he invited to stay back after the dinner call. I have prepared to offer an excellent deal on behalf of the American government, Kissinger spoke low, his grave, gravely voice hard on Ta Takeuchi's trained ear. Something small for now, but to start a relationship. We should uh, start being proactive. Takeuchi's right brow peaked, indicating that he was offended, or offended at the insinuation that Japan was not proactive, but, but he withheld further comment. The ambassador spoke half-heartedly, why don't you offer your deal over dinner? Some other time. He meant as a gentle deferral, but Kissinger took it as the ambassador's word. The plan was coming along. The National Security Advisor thanked Takeuchi for his time and urged him to go to dinner without him. Had he was left alone, Kissinger surreptitiously fled the party and made his way to a nearby payphone. He fed the machine pocket of change and found his pounded his office phone number into the keypad, leaning back into the booth as the call rang three times. The line clicked open, and not waiting for the receiving end to speak, flooded the receiver with orders. Tomorrow morning, call the embassy. Schedule dinner with us. For us. Do it before he gets into work, otherwise he might say, no, not diplomacy. I'm going to try to do well with a machine, or the Substance Abuse Recovery Act. Um, so we'll see. What causes poverty? This is a central question to the Hart administration, one that can be asked to a thousand different people with a thousand different answers. Some say it's just the way things are. Others say it's an issue of will and drive. So others still will point to economic strength or weakness, under the assumption that the state of the market determines the state of the people. This vague tidal wave of platitudes and diagnoses, when looked at as a whole, could look completely unassailable, but when broken into individual pieces, the problems suddenly become clear and workable. Also, you wonder about Woodstock, please go ahead. Far out. Such is the idea behind President Hart's early focus on the problem of drug abuse, a poison which worms its way into the blood and brains of those who, down, who are down on the luck, keeping them in the muck when they've stumbled into or even dragging them further down. Though, though heartless politicians in need of a quick boast or boost often cut their teeth on the crying the druggie, harsh punishments and prison sentences often do little more for these Americans and further tarnish their lives. The Substance Abuse and Recovery Act proposes a different route. By offering ready access to rehabilitation and recovery, the broken safety net has failed so often can finally be mended. It's a controversial act, certainly, but with a tentatively supportive Congress waiting for the vote, perhaps some ambition in the early state of, ideas, of the ideas is uh, the way to go. Lost and forgotten, in truth. He had only decided to do this on a whim, but there was there he was, wandering in the city center all by himself. He began this walk without much of a sense. Um sense of purpose or direction. It was nice to be out and about the city, town, nice to see happy faces again, actual warm, smiling faces. One that said hello without malice. These were the people who actually respected what he did for the country, and he soaked up every bit of praise he gave them. If he was being honest, though, that really wasn't why he was here, though. All along the crowded street were columns of people who were just waiting to see him, but a similar pattern emerged. Middle-aged men and women, not mostly on the older side, white, were coming up to him, shaking his hands politely, and calling him Mr. President. They were apologizing profusely, always saying sorry, telling him how unfairly people in his country had treated him. And then he didn't know quite know why. This left him angry first, then dejected, then depressed. George Wallace knew that he was popular in America, and in Alabama, and America, of course. No one would doubt that, but the way the folks on the street spoke as if he was dead and buried, then they were paying their respects. No one feels sorry for someone on the rise, someone who still has a long way to go. He didn't either sympathy. They acted as though he needed the support. A stray thought found his way into his head. Did former presidents always become irrelevant, irrelevant so quickly? Of course, Wallace was aware of just how unpopular he was nationally, but what made it worse was that seemingly everyone in the Nationalist Party wanted to forget about him. This won't do, he thought, but it wasn't too late. As he continued walking down the streets, the only thing you could think about was how he could see his legacy, his influence. He'd be thinking for a long time indeed, but some of the comments included. Finally, the Civil Rights Act returned to its respective status. So, um, but yeah, uh, so another comment was saying that basically President Hart's first term is his, or at least first years, to clean up the mess that uh, Walls left as well. Um, so, yeah, pretty much. So, uh, yeah, and we're also heading definitely toward... An uncertain face as someone else. Introduction has of the Substance Abuse and Recovery Act. This 
This act was introduced to Congress today by leading members of the Republican Democratic Coalition. Collection. Collection? Coalition. Drug addiction rates have been re rising in recent years, and civil gr society groups have been called for Congress to act. Some believe that rehabilitation programs, rather than just prison terms for users, are a more productive approach. One such person is President Hart himself, who argues that the people in the throes of addiction are unable to bootstrap themselves back into society um, <clears throat> and must be able to recover. A champion by the Hart administration, this bill would expand and subsidize rehabilitation programs for drug addicts in America's cities. The bill's introduction does not guarantee its passage. There remains conservative skeptics within the coalition, while the National Progressive PACs assailed the, legis legis uh, the legislation from the left and right. The right wing members of the PAC accused a bill of coddling criminals, while the, some of the PAC's left condemned it as a milk toast reform. The bill now faces committees, budgetary hearings, and the politicking of Washington. The Hart administration may still have to push or work to push it across the line, but the bill's importance merits the effort required, helping us at the bottom. But we have 59 yes and 39 nays, so I'm feeling pretty good. Polls of power, the Japanese ambassador of the United States, Ruji, uh, which I'm probably saying wrong, Takayuchi, had been ambushed by Harry Kissinger's staff and attending a dinner meeting with the National Security Advisor at the French Bistro, Sans Suchi. The bidding hearts have planned it all. The two would enter from a side and sit at the curtain, curtain table where Kissinger would keep him as a captive audience until an understanding was reached where the ambassador mustered himself to leave. Surely it wouldn't come to that reason Kissinger arrived early to supervise the fixings. Dinner from San Sushi may have been a good enough reason to attend for the ambassador Takuichi, who says for Western cuisine had only grown after being appointed to Washington, D.C. Still, the prospect of a mysterious deal from the American president had grown on him. Any more what Kissinger might have to offer. Ka Takayuchi seated himself inside their available dinner dining space and greeted the National Security Advisor cordially. As the ambassador skimmed his menu, Kissinger asked, Are you familiar with the theory of multipolarity? Takayuchi didn't look up, but shook his head into the negative. It holds, started Kissinger, that the global balance of power is divided between multiple poles of political influence. This includes Japan, the United States, Germany, and there's some influence of lesser powers. After the war, there was peace, he continued. But no new world order. Instead, we have grown into ourselves and are forced to share a world with a revolutionary German state. Now, since the Dark Ages has the world been so isolated from itself, and is the principal powers for responsibility to the men this divide before it destroys us. Germany cannot be trusted and cannot be negotiated with Kissinger Paws. Japan, however, is a reasonable nation. Why shouldn't we establish new consensus together? The American public was the obvious reason which Takayuchi presumed explained the literal veil of secrecy, but the prospect of a new consensus did intrigue him. I believe it is worth relaying to my superior ambassador again to pause for a sip, but I promise nothing. That was enough for Kissinger, who obliged Takayuchi's reasonability to the fullest extent of the NSA budget would allow. Here's hoping. Chop and pray. More inclined to vote. Huh. Lose faith. Pay the price. Loss of Republican and national support? Oh, God. Oh, the loss of progressive support. Yeah, no, we're good. Not under the bill working... So all focuses that proposed bills until the act is voted on. So, let's so see. This is our first one we're doing. So, all natural. It's busy, always false, tough luck. Despite the setbacks, or we'll work with party leaders to ensure second trial will not fail. All natural. Um, cha champagne pops and flows to the White House tonight as news comes from that President Hart's early agenda has been signed, sealed, and delivered by Congress. Despite the skepticism and the fear mongering of wary conservatives, Hart and his cabinet have leaned on enough lovers and convinced enough senators to see the proposals through finding common ground with those within and without his party to start the creation of a better, brighter American city and a brighter, better America with it. The foundation of cooperation built, the president can now move on to bigger, better things with his early window dressing. The promise of the ambitious policy slate now seems to be materializing in front of the nation, turning from mere hopes and dreams into real and attainable plans. The road to get there, however, remains perilous and rocky. The conservatives of the nation have no intention of sitting back while Hardin acts his will, and they will resist him with all they have. Even so, Phil Hart has no fear of his enemies. His conscience drives him forward, and you'll see the full breadth of his ideals go through come hell or high water. The Substance Abuse and Recovery Act passes the Senate, of course. Nice. And with the final tally exceeding majority support, the Substance Abuse and Recovery Act is passed. After the President of the Senate announced the result, applause rang throughout the Senate chamber. The bill's supporters cheered as those did of the citizens of the country following the bill's passage, even its opponents cursed and retreated from the chamber. The bill now approved can make its way to the President Hart's desk, where it could sign it immediately. This is an enormous moment for the most needy ur among urban communities, addicts. They now have places and procedures to recover and get back on their feet, making kicking the crippling addictions and rejoining society an actual possibility. Hopefully, these positive effects of the legislation will soon begin manifesting in cities, a helping and offer. All parties in the sense opinion of the President Hart's uh, agenda will be or set. Efficiency. Uh, the average city will increase by 5%. The homeless rate will decrease by 3%. The crime rate in the city will decrease by 2%. Nice. A will try to grip. Affirmative action that uh, ideas obscure, technical, and prone to the misrepresentation. To the average white American, affirmative action means the federal government is stepping in to tilt the table towards minority groups, African Americans especially, and depriving them of the fair shot. To the heart and the civil rights activists, affirmative action means the federal government is stepping in to equalize the table, tilting it towards minorities in order to counteract the centuries in which they, the weight of the job market has been distinctly skewed towards white Americans. In essence, affirmative action will create policies and guidelines in order to further encourage the employment of minorities who have long been passed over for better jobs and left in menial squalor by the hand of the free market. 
Yeah. It's an ambitious, controversial idea, and it's conservatives declare bloody murder about it. Martyrs, too, find themselves disturbed by the plan, morally by the thought of potentially making job and education opportunities unfair to white Americans, politically, uh, by the thought of an angry mob of voters throwing them into the street come November. The full breadth of Hart's plan may not pass. Mustard it is America, but the very least. Wider developmental fields like engineering will see the gates open for a wave of qualified minority workers ready to fulfill both their dream and the American dream. A new bill has been introduced to the United States Senate. The Urban Housing Opportunity Act uh, targets housing discrimination in American cities, forbidding racial discrimination in housing sales and rentals. This legislation came in part in response to the long-standing concerns of racial discrimination in the housing markets that remain strong even as de jure segregation or desegregation wane nationwide. This bill is particularly prior to the HEW Secretary Jane Jacobs. Not only is the issue fits with their purview of housing, but also due to support by an unnamed pen pal. President Hart, trusting Jacobs' instincts, has made the bill priority for his administration. Now the bill is left to the women of the Senate. Racism back in the sights? I love racism. Hey, you know, we got support for it, you know. Whatever. Cross the aisle. Review policy agenda. Okay. No crises. Even some nationals are on board. Also, uh, we do have a cup of mint tea here. Not coffee this time, but mint tea, because I don't think my heart can take it. Well, actually, my heart can't take it, but I don't want to kill myself with caffeine. I don't want to piss off stones just yet. I will, though. I promise you that. And then heart and soul. And then we get really in the meat and bones of this uh, campaign, even though we're like 25 minutes into the video. We've begun the great work of the Heart Presidency. Now, the first 100 days have elapsed, we have successfully strengthened our commitment in the heart and soul, or perhaps heart and soul, haha, to the improvement of the common American wheel. The President and his staff have made the transition from the simpler, more peaceful politics of the Senate to the cutthroat politics that make life in that White House so difficult. Now, an opportune time presents itself. Now, the real work begins. We have set the mood for the Heart Presidency, hopefully. We'll be able to keep our promise to the RDC and, more importantly, to the, all the people of the United States of America. If all goes well, who is a liberal, huh? American transportation will be revolutionized. The cities will become what they were meant to be all along. Scientific and educational innovation will attain a new height, and civil rights will be strengthened. Staffers of the White House, the President has full confidence in coverage, devotion to duty, and skill in political battle. We'll accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck. And let us all beseech the blessings of the Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Well, with the tone of the President, uh, heart presidency set, the gloves are off. Must we deliver honest promises to the American people. Lost in the roadmap. Well, we'll see. And... It passes. The good news spread quickly across countries. Black, Hispanic, Asian, and other racial minorities learned that at least some of their housing woes had ended. Gone in Seymour days of open discrimination by landlords and realtors. Hopefully har harboring further progress for these communities. Instead of being packed in majority minority communities with the worst housing by discrimination, non-whites seeking housing would have a fuller market to search through their preferred dwelling. Non-whites would. The legislation forbids discrimination in housing sales and rentals, making it a crucial tool for non-whites to build a lasting wealth and secure proper housing for them and their families. Now, if a black citizen can afford a house, then they can buy it. No strings attached, with no race is standing in the way. Stepping out hate. All parties' opinion will be reset. Equality between citizens will go increase by 2%, and urban wealth decrease their, stay their disdain by 5%. Okay. I'm okay with that, then. Um, let's see. 40%. Uh, 76. Calm. The benefit of the doubt so far, still. All right. We've not done all the trials yet. Also, I did research a lot of things ahead of time because I got bored. I'll be honest. And I didn't want to deal with... Uh, a lot of stuff anymore. Where we guns? Oh, was it just automatically made? Maybe it is. The sign. And here's the common area to be shared by the residents of the block. Available to any president or any resident of St. Louis. The public housing official said to President Hart, who gazed about keenly, a playground for the children, and benches to sit, and grass for all sorts of games. Excuse me, what's that? The president asked politely, indicating scrawled writing on a nearby wall. Grimacing that had not been uh, covered up in time for the visit, the official approached with heart to decipher the vandalism. The president did not read the word, his lip curling at the vile slur adopted on the wall. To be frank, sir, we've had issues on the front, the official. A man named Theo said, adjusting his tie, local residents think public housing means more black people will be in the neighborhood and we've had complaints. How common is this? Are there other incidents going beyond vandalism? Fairly common, unfortunately. Racist fear is spreading among local whites. They're afraid that the new black residents will bring crime, undercut their wages, and crowd their schools. The blacks are well aware of how the whites feel, but just want a better life. The community is divided further and further by the day. The Theo trailed off, suddenly aware of how freely he was speaking to the president of the United States, which I think I read before. Hart frowned, uh, sitting in the graffiti, or graffito, like it was a venomous insect. This was the enemy, this bigotry, this closed-mindedness. They would overcome it with time, with work, with, with words, but not today. He turned away, urging Theo to continue his presentation, even as the growing racial tensions nodded the president's mind. Peter with that nonsense as soon as he can. The federal highway program is run over budget and under schedule for years on end. The buck stops here. Gain new tools that assess America's staggering p p transportation climate. Funding for interstate programs will increase. Less likely to run into understepping issues. Increase uh, uh, the progress on transportation reform. Trouble in the cabinet. American cities must be reborn and saved from lawlessness and poor living conditions currently plaguing them. Uh, we acknowledge this and oversee the rebirth of American cities, ending their decay. 
that seems like it would be good to do immediately. The second American Revolution, the American people fallen, fallen out of favor of the sciences. Part of our efforts in the office will be to commit to the oversee a new scientific age and have America reclaim its position as a bastion of scientific development. And then the last one is ink and skin. Amer uh, communities, America's cities are communities for all Americans, not just a few. The administration already oversees the process of urban renewal, making it a top priority to combat discrimination and segregation hidden in the blueprints of prejudiced architects. Where are we at with, uh, oh, sh oh, we're, right, right, race rights. As a social crisis, the only way to prevent the ultimate culmination of the crisis of race rights is a peace of rights activist and push for domestic equality. Turn out in the next election. Meet community leaders. Urban voters will support the nationalist cause. Equality in the average city will increase by 3%. Form structural reform commissions. Nine percent, four percent, three percent, equality, five percent. Uh, support the police. Increase turnout. Urban voters will decrease the turnout. Crime will have to go down. Happiness will go down, though. Diversify URI investments. Decrease the turnouts. Equality will go by seventy percent. Upkeep will go by nine percent. Budget hawks will decrease, increase their dislike for us. Um. Uh, this one doesn't seem so bad. More conservative on the issue of domestic policy. Urban voters become more nationalist, though. 9%. Now, let's meet community leaders. This is one where we don't get anything wrong with us. Or get any negative penalties so far. Failing support, calm, supportive, giving us the benefit of the doubt. Um, so, then we can also see what they like. But spending power of average Americans will go down, increase tremendously. What truly lose trust? Oh boy. Heart and soul. Um, if you remember this one, please go right ahead. I've tough for history, history books. Well, let's go with. Let's go with this one. Shining Megapolis on the Hill. We won't be hard pressed to wrap their heads around the sprawling, labyrinth themed patchwork of businesses, markets, and customers that make up the American economy and the drive of the American prosperity in the nuclear age, the best weapon against tyranny yet. Its imperfections are many from inequality and inequity amongst workers and wages, and the endless struggle between big business and big labor to small businesses eking out a meager existence amidst cutthroat competition. Imperfections are drive forth the ills that infest the streets of our cities from declining industry to increased crime and urban decline. The solution to these woes is not less government, as some on the right would believe, not to let our cities decline and our industries falter, no. It's the opinion of the administration that what America needs is liberalism that builds, an enduring commitment to the righting of the ills of society, the imperfections of the economy, and the struggles of those unable to help themselves. We will ensure our cities prosper and our poor are fed and the economy is free from foreign dependency. The road ahead will be long and hard, the costs will be great and the problem many, but we shall not rest before we have built that shining city on a hill. Lost on the roadmap. Let's go on the final dossier that goes out on this department staff and the press, so I'd like to reiterate this is our official policy. Does uh, everyone follow? Fill apart. Still not quite fit with the presidency. Push his head up to gauge the reactions of this cabinet. Vice President Morrison, seated to the president's right, nodded in affirmation as its secretaries McCarthy, Mitchell, Scranton, uh, leaving the secretary Jane Jacobs, directed to the president's left as a sole dissenter. Something wrong, Jane Hart asked? It's just uh, Jane Jacobs pushed her horn-rimmed glasses and scanned the loose papers in her hands. This isn't quite what we agreed in our meetings, Mr. President. The, vi the VP groaned, which was met by President Trucler from Hart, before allowing Secretary Jacobs to continue. Our platform on transportation is admirable, as our positions on civil rights and education, but our attitude towards the cities is kind of unclear. Uh, we can afford to be vague, snarked Morrison retort, and promises are dangerous at this stage. Mayor Moore spoke matter-of-factly, eliciting a frown from Jane Jacobs. Respectfully, Mr. President, uh, stated uh, Secretary Jacobs, coming to her feet, I disagree. Sees the recent of the administration's policy, expanding the HEW Secretary, and implementation of all other parts of the agenda, relied on the success in the cities. If the cities are in working order, the city sees across, sitting on the front line in the fight for civil rights, and our education reforms will be darned if our urban schools are in disrepair. We cannot afford to go halfway. Just as quickly as she had risen, the firebrand Jacobs returned to her seat, content that she had made her point, and indeed, one by one, cabinet members nodded in affirmation, leaving the president to consider his agenda with new anatomy. New life for this American city? President Hart has managed the initial trials of his presidency and now stands at the crossroads. He now has the option to focus on transportation, urban revitalization of sciences, inequality, and diplomacy. Wait. Breaking the heart of the world. Okay. The sword is but one of the tools as the president has at his disposal. The previous administration has seemed to have forgotten that. The Hart administration will not be able to go out to the table. Will not be free to go to the table. Ah, here we are. Uh, it's the time to try a different approach. Instead of hastily revving up the war machine, we'll hear out our adversaries. It's time to speak softly and carry a giant stick. Huh. Fashion of our freedom. 14 days. Worldwide democracy for decades. It's founding the Organization of Free Nations. He has been keen on maintaining American leadership across the globe. I want to do this one. Eisenhower's blessing. Crime and lawlessness is not good. 
Crime combating programs lose 9% effectiveness in handling crime. Crime rate will go down. Steam and steel. Ooh, industrial XP slowly gets a better though. I'll go this one. The symbiotic relationship between organized labor and the Democratic Party has become a cornerstone of the modern party system since President Roosevelt entered office three decades ago. Unions aid the party with crucial organizing and fundraising abilities, providing Democratic candidates with a solid base upon which to draw. This relationship has been strained over the years, from the Eisenhower administration's careful moderation to the cold shoulder of Nixon. The administration's ambitious program of urban renewal and labor reform, however, demands a much warmer touch. The cooperation of men like Reuter and Meany, and by extension the UAW and AFL-CIO, must be is a must if we are to succeed. Thus, we risk fracturing the entire Democratic Party. And hello, new friend. Also, I kind of want to do this one again. Homecoming of this guy. It's pretty good, well pushed for environmental protections. Uh, all Americans across gave him affordable health care. Since the meeting, Dr. Kissinger and his staff waited anxiously for the Japanese ambassador's response to their secret diplomatic overtures. This initiative's success would mean normalizing relations between Japan and the United States. Both nations might finally put World War II behind them, and the Kissinger staff felt like they were sitting on the cutting edge of history. All that was required was an uh, answer in the affirmative. Suddenly the phone rang, Kissinger frantically motioned for silence. He placed a receiver to his ear and inquired, Hello? Staffers likewise picked up the phones and clasped the mouthpiece of their hands, shaking in eager anticipation. A few seconds passed before the warm voice of Ambassador Takayuchi replied, Hello, Dr. Kissinger, are you well? Yes, Kissinger returned, uh, who was clearly more interested in the hearing about the offer. I have good news. My government is open to ta start talking on trade or border delineation. If you so wish, these can be kept secret. The office nearly went with joy. But the boss insisted on silence. From now on, we should do all the business and person security. A puzzled silence followed until the ambassador offered an okay, and the com conversation tapered off. Kissinger sat his phone loudly and signaled his staff to cheer. He relished in their applause. Where do I plug in the red phone? It's coalition sports waning with the hardline Republicans. 84% is really good. Hardline Republicans. Hardline Republican. Um, 10% is not bad. Na it devoids the regulation. Hardline Republicans. Budget surplus. Well, we'll do this one. Let's do two. Uh, how are the Democrats doing? Faction health is poor for the Dixiecrats. 93%. Jesus Christ, that's really strong. I'm feeling pretty good about that. The trouble in the cabinet is next. New blood, huh? Well, we're going to go with this one next. Because industrial expertise could be better. As we did lose some advent efficiency as well, which sucks. So, uh... Ooh, we're going to go to the liberal option. Jane Jacobs and President Hart poured over the urban reconstruction plans in the Oval Office. We have to consult the local community on the best place for the improvements, Jacobs said. If we're going to keep the goodwill, we can't be seen out of touch. I've been meaning to talk to you about that, actually, President Hart said. What would you say to including VP Morrison more in the decision-making process here? One of the reasons I picked him was his experience with urban development as mayor of New Orleans. Jacobs actually looked like she was about to be ill at that. You know all my feelings of Morrison, she said. When he was mayor, he oversaw all the injustices we've been trying to fight against. I know you had to balance a ticket, but I don't want that man anywhere near what we're doing. Once a dictocrat, always a dictocrat. For all the horror, war oftentimes draws innovation from inspired minds and learned experience. Consider General Eisenhower, who retired from his duties having been enlightened by the German Autobahn. His builders were heinous by the fact that it expedited the movement of men. The material and commerce across the heart of Europe was undeniable. The vision of an America intertwined and united by such a vast network of asphalt and concrete was first among equals that had driven the war hero to the White House. His hopes and its scopes were both dashed by a truant Congress, however, and to this day the interstate highway system remains a pale, half-built shadow of its planners' most conservative proposals. With the immensity of our task to expand the interstate above and beyond what has been envisioned, it's only proper that we beseech well wishes from the greatest brainchild among them. The toil ahead, after all, is for his legacy as much as it is ours. Enduring Chug. Democracy Mobile. Uh, funding for the state will increase. America runs on. Increase of progress. Commerce will increase. Probably will slowly begin to improve. A little bit of this. I want to do this one. A colossus with feet of clay will crumble. In order to ensure our ambitious infrastructure general won't run any snags, a hard administration must repair and revamp the national highway system like that Ike Eisenhower started. It'll be costly, thankless, and price the expenditure that our opponents will eviscerate us for. Despite this, the safety of motorists all across America will be well worth the cost as bill will incur. We'll recover from understaffing more quickly, and funding will increase, which is something that we definitely want. So, and they'll also do the second American Revolution. For the vast majority of Americans, the bedrock of who they are as a person comes from their education. Memories often first hold on to playground incidents and childhood friends. Interests click into place during long classes and lectures. Fuzzy ideas are sharpening and solidifying through high school and for those who pursue it, growing through higher education. Our first friends, first successes, and humiliations, the first social miles, and all come during this time of learning. A great education system takes in the young and makes them into bright, empathetic, intelligent men and women who are ready to live a, a productive, ha healthy, happy life. So why, then, does our system fall so short of these lofty ideals? What is Yuchun forced to digest slavish propaganda the, in, to the emperor in Yokohama, or to the affair in Frankfurt to compete with and surpass the knowledge of the American student in inner-city New York City, or... Uh, 
the plains of Nebraska. There is are historical reasons, of course, but, but they all amount to excuses. Reasonable ones, perhaps, but excuses all the same, and what are young ones need are solutions, not platitudes. Those who do not have the chance to obtain formal education cannot be left to rot while the nation moves on without them. What America desperately needs is a restored modern education system, informative and all-encompassing, able to both bring in young and teach the old. Their teachers must be the finest in the world, their meals nourishing and substantial, the materials shiny new. The youth are the future of this country. Let's treat them as such. This old man, dear President Hart, I follow you with great interest the campaign of you and Mr. Morris, and of whom I, you know I am already acquainted. <clears throat> After the difficulties of the past four years and indulging work of the U.S. Senate to resolve them, I was heartened by this past November to see the success of your presidential venture and the triumph of common sense governance once again. As you are well aware, there is no single cause to the problems our nation faces, with the military entanglements, competition from abroad, and unrest in our cities. Unrest. We need experienced leaders to develop solutions can take our country forward. I have no doubt that you are capable of that responsibility. Uh, <clears throat> I am sure you will see many successes over these next few years. Yours, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, Philip Harper put down the letter, increasingly wrinkled from his habit of reading and rereading it. It arrived by post, what, a few weeks before the old general's passing? One of the last things that the President Eisenhower had been done to write to him, to remind him of his obligations. The letter seemed to heart a link to the past, a torch passed from one generation to the next. He wasn't even in the politics when Ike was sworn in, and the president launched in his grand vision of the interstate highway system, and now, now is Hart's highway system. With Eisenhower, Kefalfer, and Kennedy dead, it was up to him to bear the mantle of liberalism. He had to be the kind of leader that could make those men proud, who could finish what they started. Would Ike be proud of the administration we're leaving? Also, I have a question for you guys all. Whenever I save my game now, um, it, says, it gives us a temp save file, which sucks. Um, but then, like, I, with these saves, you can't load them and make the game work anymore, which sucks, so... Um, is it possible to fix that? But the build the invisible bridge, I guess. I get Mr. Kennedy. I still want to do that one though. Oh. In his meeting with Philip Hart on the national security, Dr. Kissinger felt a distinct sense of power over the president. Hart didn't know that Kissinger had just secured an inroad for negotiations with Japan, something previously considered impossible. Everything President Hart asked or felt said infantile to Kissinger, who amused to himself about the president, a uh, president in ignorance. Still, he answered each question readily and obediently until he saw a chance to assert himself. President Hart was clattering his loose papers together when Kissinger cleared his throat and began broaching the subject of Japan. I've received very positive signals from the Japanese ambassador regarding secret talks, he said with a smirk. You need to only offer your approval. Surprised Philip Hart's face, who was well aware, Kissinger, who wasn't aware, actually, who made contact with the Japanese government. I assume you've told President or Secretary Truman about this. Kissinger conceded, not precisely, but he promised Truman would be consulted in the future. Besides, boasted Kissinger, did the results not speak for themselves? We can create the greatest diplomatic linkage of our lifetime. But all of you support me. Not only was the answer unsatisfying to Phil Park, but its audacity also enraged him. How could an advisor dictate policy to the president? Still, the results were promising, and Hart figured failure at the stage would be relatively harmless. Just be mindful, suggested the president, and his voice into a displeasure before he dismissed Dr. Kissinger. Mindfulness is essential in diplomacy, Mr. President. Uh, he will pursue detente with Japan, whether the State Department likes it or not. Henry Kissinger, like many statesmen, served in World War II. Together, they lived through the stunning defeats the Allies suffered. As the old wounds healed, these two veterans in the high office have held a new vision for the world. They shared similar foreign policy stances, hence why he is President Hart's National Security Advisor. Together, they will each out schedule a plan for the free world to defeat the reaction forces of the Reich and the core prosperity sphere. German Doctrine Henry Truman is an interesting fellow and is reflecting his foreign policy. If, essentially, so we're always in a position to make demands, even after the, our, bloody, our bloody nose in World War II. The shameful untreaty ports, the loss of Hawaii, despite all this, Uncle Sam's the one with the bargaining chip. Fifty years ago, this was a traditional stance on foreign policy. And this uh, strange, strange rule, however, it's anything but ordinary. Oh, that one's a well-informed citizen. For a decade, our politicians have been asking why Johnny can't read and write and read and what to do about it, but they haven't had the guts to address the problem at the roots. Secretary Jacobs was in the Oval Office presenting her thoughts to the President of Hart on education in America. All these newfangled initiatives belie the fact that the problem with our education isn't our curriculum, it's our school systems themselves. When the pioneers were spreading out across the Great Plains, it was a school that served to anchor their communities. Urban nodes, according to my theories, that provide many essential services to their surroundings. Not just impairing knowledge on the next generation, but giving them a place to socialize and a shared experience that shapes our, their worldview. How can we address the deficiencies in our education without supporting our schools. President Hart nodded. Secretary Jacobs, I completely concur. For too long, we allowed our schools to decay and our students to fall behind the other superpowers. We need new investments, not only to construct new schools and undeserved communities in order to address inequality, but refurbish and revitalize existing schools. To make them the community centers you described them as. To make them something America can take pride in. Hart looked down at his desk, a feeling of awareness passing through him. As the battles over integration has shown, education is one of the thorniest issues in American politics. Many parents felt a strong sense of ownership over the schools and might object vigorously to any overreach by the federal government in that regard, not to mention the constitutional issues that might arise in interfering with the domain traditionally left to the state. Still, he refused to give up on America's children. We've got a long way, you know, a long, road, a long, hard road ahead of us, and Madam Secretary, let's get to work. And ink and skin. There's not an American today who's unaware of the civil rights movement. The long-standing struggle of the black community to achieve equality in America has ebbed and flowed since the beginning of the century ago. 
from Fregos Douglas to W.E. W.E.B. Dubois to Martin Luther King Jr. to innumerable others, the brave actions of black men and women in the face of fast discrimination and brutality is nothing short of incredible. After far too long, the civil rights legislation has been devoted to breaking racism's most evident bindings, adding a, a, <clears throat> segregation, denial of constitutional rights, and workplace discrimination to many in America. This signaled the culmination of the fight. Inequality had been defeated, and the country could rest, heal, and relax, such as the hope of the majority of the Americans, who are now more interested with law and order rather than further racial conflict. Unfortunately, the spirit of Jim Crow still lives on the weeds of America, away from the eyes of John Q. Public. It lives on in redlining and secret con covenants to maintain segregation and the dog whistles and unfair policies. No, no, discrimination isn't dead. It has gotten smarter and we must get smarter to oppose it effectively. To many white Americans, President Hart's promise to further the fight for equality evokes nervous shifting in their seats. What does he mean when he says he's going to balance the programs of the New Deal? What is this White House planning when they talk about housing inequality or urban renewal? Is this going to affect their neighborhoods or their way of life? All this and more means the President's role will not be any easier than his predecessors. It requires sacrifice, compromise, and disappointment. What will result in it successful? As a more perfect union for everyone. And if there isn't such if it is if if that isn't worth the effort, then there isn't then there isn't much that is. So I got, we gotta balance everything out here, which kinda sucks, but makes perfect sense, you know. We just have to be balanced. That's all. Except for a budget. We're trying to balance that out as much as we possibly can. Which is not easy. But look at that admin expenditure now. Look at this. Oh boy. So right now, that's how much we get. Ooh, we do more. We're gonna spend more, which sucks. We get more taxable population, slightly more taxable population, which I I prefer. Oh, science. More research speed, better research, uh, monthly facilities change. We spend a lot of money here. Um. Next one we can do. Urban votes decrease their thing. Less crime, less happiness. Where are we at for this? Twenty-one percent calm, supportive of the administration, failing to support civil rights, whatever. Conservative on domestic policy, urban voters, senior partnership. We'll do that one. And we'll do this one like at the end of this episode too. So. Yeah. Just use the CIA to diminish the ideology of other people. Wow, look at this. Wow. Ink and skin. The game of life. Increase the administration's progress on social welfare. Oh, that's not bad. Making America. Equality. More liberal than issue civil rights. Um, com competition and innovation. Yes. There's a lot of which America loves about our schools. America loves football. This Friday night lights on the high school gridiron iron epics which play out between our colleges every Saturday. America loves the prestige of its best accomplishment of, the, of simply making it into Harvard or Yale. America loves the research and inventions which emerge from our highest institutions building a better future for the country and world. Most of all, though, America loves itself a good competition. The most common threat between school sports, school admissions, and school innovation in America is a competition. Michigan and Ohio State go at each other's throats not just because they're close, but because of over a century of hatred between them and their states that tendered something far beyond simple grievances. God, I hate it. I hate Ohio. The same story plays out in institutions great and small around the country, extending far beyond campus or even academia, puncturing, puncturing the fabric of the American spirit. America is not only the nation on earth with its competitions and rivalries, but it may be the only nation where crushing your rivals and being the best so is so deeply ingrained into every fiber of its being. God, I hate Ohio. Thus, when we go to a Congress to plead our case, perhaps a change of angle should be considered. No more pleading for cash, no more blank, bland charts, graphs. We'll make it very clear that this is the greatest competition in human history, and what good American can turn down a great competition? No more shall Americans simply care about the way in which we, the wars go or the fortunes of their political parties or how the sports seasons are shaping up. They'll gather around the TV from Tampa to Tacoma and we'll watch the best of our children create grand new things, and they will cheer in the knowledge that Americans, not Nazis or Pan-Asianists, will be the ones who set the future, course of the future, except people from Ohio. Sorry, Ohio. No, I'm not. I'm not sorry at all. As much as we can. I like the Republicans vote in favor. Nice. Buttons and levers. Oh, that'd be good. Technology, 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 technology. That is the hard administration stance on manufacturing. It's imperative that America becomes a leader not only in manufacturing, every te technology imaginable, but also an innovator. The right and co prosperity will uh, expand all they can. Oh, all the energy catching up with us. By the time they do, they'll be ready to block ahead. What do we have over here? So we have this one, of course, going on. Efficiency will increase a little bit more. Spending power will go down. Crime rate will get worse. So we're going to try to improve that as much as we possibly can. Um, oh, we are supporting the wishes of the civil rights advocates, which is not bad. Um, what was this other one? Urban renewal initiative. Interstate. Oh, interstate construction. Okay, that's fine. Keep killing that budget because eventually we're going to balloon it back up. Hey, look at that. Nice. Very nice. What is that? Oh, where to start? In the bowels of the embassy of the Empire of Japan, two men conduct what hope each to be the diplomatic achievement of their lives over a plate of sushi. I do hope that sushi is to your liking, said Ambassador Taka Takayuchi. It's so hard to find in America, so I brought my uh, private chef. It's quite all right, uh, said uh, Henry Kissinger, grimacing as he fumbled with his chopsticks. If Takayuchi noticed his opponent's numbers 
opposite numbers difficulties. He didn't show it in any case, or in any event, the ambassador said, I've talked with my government. They're interested in the possibility of detente between our two powers. I believe that's a good first step, which is to try to negotiate a security agreement, scaling down a mutual military presence in the Pacific, and a free process against the Reich. Kissinger swallowed a tuna roll. I agree this would be constructive, but I also think it's too early. Congress would tear the administration apart over something like that. I would imagine, though, uh, I don't wish to presume that many in Japan would be similarly unenthused. We need a smaller scale agreement to start, to get people used to the idea, perhaps something to do with reopening trade. Hmm, that's very wise, Takayoshi moves after a sip of tea. There are a number of outstanding trade issues between us, fishing rights. Passage through territory waters, certain groups will always complain, but this shouldn't be insurmountable. This is the first step. Nice. I made a little progress in. I made a little progress for pretty much everything. And for the boys, we're getting a worsen for home use. Made in America. Yeah, why not? Our foreign policy should be to embarrass our enemies. If a German diplomat uh, were to step into any home, they would discover a full pantry, a color TV, and household appliances would be reserved only for the upper crust. This would ensure that the master race sees with envy. Any spies living among us will think twice about the work they are doing when they expose the amenities of America. It's imperative that the free rule will prosper in the, in the light and embarrass our enemies in the dark. Oh, we're voting for these people. We're going to vote R&D. American mom. So a woman for president, huh? Whisperer. Watching Schleife's interview from across the room. Well, beats me. That's for darn sure. Never thought I'd see in my day. He let a little chuckle, finding this situation apparently rather humorous. Well, I don't buy it. Not for one second, muttered his co-producer. Pete, this whole housewife act, you know what I mean? What sort of housewife even runs for president? Who does she, who does she think she's kidding? If she wants to be a housewife so bad, she should just stay home. Oh, my bad. You know, I heard she used to work for some think tank over in D.C. It doesn't get much less housewifey than that. Oh, and her husband, Herb, left out a several lap. This one's a real kicker. He's some big shot lawyer down in St. Louis. It's like the jokes that just write themselves. A homegrown American housewife who's neither homegrown nor a housewife. A real American, my butt. Even you pass for a better American housewife than her. Not pay much to Herb, Pete went on, although I wonder how much of her act she really believes. I mean, how can she just get up in front of national television and say all this crap without a hen of doubt? Doesn't sit right with me, all these politicians and the constant lying and scheming. It's already hard enough to trust a woman with power, but a woman politician? Schleifey, I don't think I could ever find an enemy to trust with someone like her. Me neither, beat me neither. Just like me, you know, people from Ohio. Oh, we can add 19 more. No more Republicans, interesting enough. But it will help destroy this uh, MPP, so. Also, I, I like to click this one. I love this edition, saying, hide the states and are not up for election so we can really figure out where we want to push our buttons. Um, so let's do it over here. I love that edition. It's so good to have. Uh, how's the uh, get a move on going? Unpurchased. Huh? Oh, investigate funding mis mismanagement. We'll recover from budget issues more quickly. Fire inefficient accountants. Nothing's really going on here, so. Ike's blessing. Okay. Yeah, find, find all the inefficiencies and get rid of the things that are keeping us you know, back. Nice. Good. So far, I'm feeling pretty good about this uh, this campaign. And we're really focusing on te technology and stuff, even though we should be focusing on some other stuff, the treatment documents such as uh, for home use. This would be great. I love it. I really want to focus on the interstate. Bricks and windows. Crime would decrease. I do want to get rid of crime, though. Counter violence, crime. Urban wealth would not like us more. But for officers, lose effectiveness. State of hate. Executive order. Uh, gun control. Bro, you coming for my guns? Happiness. Arm control and indexing. So after this one, entering Chug, America runs on. Commerce increase. Poverty slowly improve. Uh, America runs on. America without trucking industries and car without wheels. For the longest time, our truckers have been on their own. The operating at margins that would make any entrepreneur uncomfortable one bad haul away from disaster. It's time to relieve the men and women on the roads of America. Uh, with government subsidies, our truckers can hire more workers, make emergency funds, and most importantly, keep America running. To push or not to push. Government's off. Grace. Uh, Phil Pardo has been a patriot and more or less fell in line with his president. But God, not taller the CIA agent. To CIA. To him, the CIA represented everything wrong with society and actively poisoned democratic society. As a senator. A heart led efforts to keep the shadowy government in check and advocated where he could stop regime change and social manipulation. His promise to swear off using the organization came easy to heart, and he fought a son of the war against agency chiefs with glee. That was until attitudes uh, uh, towards hardened and outside advice reached the president. When Secretary of State Harry Truman and Senator James Eastland first suggested that Hart expand the CIA operations in the pact, the president backed off. 
Secretary of Defense Edward Lansdale similarly pointed towards the benefits of covert anti-German sabotage, but again, Hart was reluctant. I have said a president, the president would say repeatedly, and I won't fall back on it. Each recitation carried more and more emotion as virtues continued to be challenged. It was undeniable the CIA operations would expedite a German collapse, but at what cost to American society? During a meeting with the National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger, the president made up his mind, Henry, he started. Not looking up from his briefing, do you think the CIA could operate in Germany? A pause followed as Kissinger processed what he was hearing. Well, yes, I have been saying. Uh, Kissinger started with a response, but the president cut him off. I know what you've been saying. I know what you want. Another pause. I've come to terms with us. Twilight. The CIA, as it sends a shiver through the spine about the Albert and Tokomonsu Khan alike, unfortunately gives President Hart the heebie jeebies too. The daily briefings can be hard to stomach, nevertheless. The president has reluctantly acknowledged the soft power that is the robust secret agency excludes. With some encouraging words from Lansdale and Kissinger, the president Hart has given his tacit approval for the CIA to go all the way, whether in shadowy back alleyways or smoky officers' clubs. All pass by, all pass by the president's desk. Oh. To push or not to push. Hart had been expecting to see Kissinger enter the office after knocking the door. He hadn't been expecting to see the man who followed him. Ambassador Takayuchi, the president said, hoping his start wasn't too obvious. A pleasure. Well, I invited the ambassador along because we're of the same mind when it comes to the eve of the detente. Oh, look at that. Nice. Um, uh, Kissinger said, taking a seat without having been invited. Coordinating a strategy together would, I think, help this go over well with other governments. Takayuchi remained standing, uh, taking the embassy next to Kissinger after Hart pointed to it. The ambassador leaned forward. When he spoke, his English was perfect. We're planning to begin initial negotiations soon. My goal is that these negotiations succeed no matter what. I don't feel subjects such as fishing riots as a serious concern. There are others in my country, however, who do see any concessions, no matter how small the surrender. If Japan is allowed to put forward its terms, it will greatly smooth over resistance to detente from more radical elements in my countries. Hart, Hart grimaced, adjusting his glasses. I see the wisdom in your approach, Ambassador said. But opposition to the U.S. will be just as fierce, if not more. The opposition, then the opposition in Japan. If we accept a Japanese leading proposal, it could poison detente for the American people. We need to give the people something, say, an extension of fishing rights in the Pacific. He stroked his chin, weighing his options. Detente can't be seen surrender, push for more. Both their Tokyo bone, let him make the first move. Let's make them, let's give them the first move, why not? So we'll see what happens. Um, construction. Ooh. Are we building anything? Effect in six days? It doesn't look like it. Interstate 10. 23%, 30. Yeah, we're not really doing very much here. Can I click on this? Yeah, no. No, what's going on? America runs on that. What we'll keeps us together? Marta Trust. Take a rest. Budget Hawks are not like that, but whatever. Oh, I 95 will be a top priority to be completed as a benchmark of the Interstate Highways Program in Revitalization. <sighs> After months of schmoozing in the political elites of Washington and doling out favors to insiders, we are ready to continue Eisenhower's dream of a national highway system, the I-95, running along the East Coast, will be the first milestone of this administration. As progress is currently stalled and sitting in a state of disrepair by working closely with the Highway Commission, we'll see this project through to completion. God bless President Hart, and God bless these soon-to-be-connected United States of America and made in America. The hub machinery brought a strange comfort to President Hart as he toured this factory floor. As a senator from Michigan, he had visited many floors over his career. This is the heart of America that kept beating on despite the war, its vast industry that constantly reinvented itself, he was not missing a reinvention with his own eyes. Come this way, Mr. President. He was being guided by none other than Dr. Gordon Moore himself, one of the great pioneers of the transistor and America's hero in the face of Guangdong's seemingly invincible dominance of the electronics industry. In 1968, he quit Fairchild uh, Semiconductors to found a new corporation, Intel, whose transistor designs were now taking America by storm. Moore stopped in front of the table with a pile of completed chips lying on top of it. Finding a set of tweezers from a groove on the side, he picked one up and held it in front of heart. We call this the 1103, the first dynamic random access memory chip to be produced domestically, completely made in America. Hart nodded, nodded approvingly. Dr. Moore, you have my deepest thanks. The Japanese and Guangdong have been running circles around us for more than a decade, but thanks to you, we might just be able to hold our own in electronics. Great things are coming from this, and you have America's support. The president took extra time to marvel at this device. Thousands of transistors on any one tiny chip. According to Moore, they would fit twice the number next year. America is now back. <sighs> the price of life. I don't think we'll be able to do this one still. We can take a look at it, maybe. Real quick. Bring it, Mr. Kennedy. Which I probably read in the last episode. The price of life. Let's see what America, Phil said. Um, yeah, if you want to do this again, please go ahead. Congress votes. Well. Uh, well, if it fails, it fails. Like normal, like we did last time. Fight for your life. Good luck, Ted. If you want to do this again, please go ahead. Okay, so now we said. So, yeah, it's overwhelmingly negative, which sucks. Um, Republicans really don't support that. Chop and pray. Lots of progressive support. Ooh, pay the price. Even if we did this one, closing the door, 
Oh, please come in. Oh, I'll say with a smile. I don't have many visitors, so excuse your lack of preparation, but it's great to have you around. Can I get you anything? The young man's notebook was already open. Thank you, Mr. Walls, but there's no need. I'd like to get straight to the business. As it continued, Walls noted that the young man was clearly reading from a printed script. Now, I'm sure you're aware of Phyllis Schlafy's meteoric rise in the polls. I have two questions. First, what are your views on Schlafy's recent polling performances? Also, have you spoken to her recently? Walls blinked once and twice, staring the journalist in the face. No, I wasn't aware she was doing so well. Um, I'll say that American News candidates like her and that she has my full support and total support. But no, I haven't spoken to her in the past few months. The journalist continued jotting down the notes for a few seconds after Walls ended. The former president interjected, say some, why are you asking these questions? Oh, it's just because Mr. Schlafy wants absolutely nothing to do with you, so we're trying to see what you have to say about her. Long after the journalist left, the incident remained in Walls' mind, and as he might, they couldn't escape the singular ob obvious conclusion. Well, that's the Nationalist Party now, as we've just passed him forever. Maybe we do this one. Like. So 35. Is that, did that do nothing? In 13 days. We did that, but it did nothing, which is not good. Which is honestly really bad. So, uh, we'll have to redo this one again, which is fine, whatever. Uh, terrible campaign. But, uh, oh well, it is what it is. They're in an impeccable campaign. America runs on. Across on Delaware, of course, we won't do that one too. And let it fail. Yeah, so it failed. But whatever. In the meantime, what do we want else to do? Take a rest. What keeps us together? Cutting some corners? Final spike. Less likely to run into supply shortages. Recover from licensing issues more quickly. Uh, urban realities. Ooh, that's not bad. And more happiness, efficiency, commerce, public transportation. That's cool. Enduring cities, America's back. Glory of rail. Um, I do want to do more of this stuff here, too. Industrial anthem. Or do this with stuff as well. The best weapons. Academic base increases. All costs of upkeep goes up. Let freedom ring. Increased by 15%. Or the right stuff. Pastures Innovation. I do like the one as well. At first glance, no one no, not noticed the relationship between science and agriculture. However, the relationship is becoming intertwined. As agricultural scientists innovate the fields, farmers around the world will have better crop yields. Better crop yields lead to better profits for farmers on all sizes. Better profits make everyone happy. That administration will facilitate this ripple effect. It all starts in the pastures of innovation in the game of life. Making America. Well, let's do this one. Because we can do this one. If we're going to become more liberal in civil rights and domestic issues, we can save that for like election stuff. Which we kind of already have, but there's an ancient Chinese four character idiom that speaks to the ultimate and goal of Philip Hart, now that he's president of the US. Its little translation is rich country, peace people. As one might expect, it means a reality in which the country is prosperous and the people are at peace. Whereas we are working to build this reality with the United States through tireless labors and education, desegregation, transportation throughout the country, it will be all for nothing we cannot manage to fix the most basic problem beleaguering many of our cities. That many young people, or many people, don't simply have the opportunity they certainly need to do well in the game of life. So many Americans, especially in the cities, are forced to move on from one house to another by scoundrel landlords and the vagaries of employers. Worse yet, they struggle to find jobs, which in turn destroy their financial security, and thus forces them to prioritize the most basic primal needs of survival over any other meritorious things crucial for their own success and that of their children. How is this a good thing? How does this reassemble or resemble the great American dream? If let things carry on like this, are we truly any better than the fascists and the Yamatos? Obviously, we will not wait a moment longer. People need a house, a job, and education. They need a solid place to call their home, and so they can peacefully raise the next generation. It's our duty to secure a simple life for people. That you will not, we will not falter or fail in this. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll continue expanding to see what else we can do with the Heart Administration. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.